to reflect on a few things to do with basically running successful Collaborate, Blackboard Collaborate webinars. We've all been using them a bit more now with the lockdown in place um, for both teaching uh, and meetings. So, you know, people who've used them before are starting to experiment with some of the more advanced features and those who've never used it before are starting to use it for the first time. And we've been very busy as learning technologists supporting all of that, but it's been really fascinating to to see how it's going and some other things that people are doing. And also we wanted to importantly highlight some of the things that you might want to try and avoid. So some of the pitfalls that we're seeing are happening. Okay. So we've constructed a top 10 list of things that you might want to consider when you're running a collaborate session. Also the things that we're going to cover, although it's um, kind of like about collaborate this video, that the things that we mentioned, a lot of them will also apply to if you're using other um, technologies such as Google Hangouts and so on. So kicking off with number one, use PDFs. Um, so if you are sharing slides in a collaborate session, and this is quite a common thing for people to do, um, we strongly suggest that beforehand you take your completed uh, uh, PowerPoint slides, convert them into a PDF, and then you can upload that PDF and share that in Collaborate. Um, the reason we're suggesting this is it will keep the formatting uh, much better. Often Collaborate will mess around with the alignment of images, um, for example. So make a PDF and use that instead of the original PowerPoint. Other things to consider on this point are if you are building those slides that you're going to use, consider putting um, a first slide in, an orientation slide that can be on the screen as people are joining. Um, and it can have some housekeeping information and instructions on it, some reminders. So it might have something about if you can't hear us, um, let us know in the chat, um, in the chat window, and we'll try and help. Uh, also, it might, you know, it's a good idea to have when the session will actually start, what time. So if people log in early, they can see it won't start for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. Uh, also, it's probably a good idea to tell them either on that first slide or certainly at the beginning of the session that the session is going to be recorded if it is. Okay, number two, this is about webcam and microphone considerations, quite an important one, this. Um, so, first of all, you have to consider, um, do you need to use your video? Because it does use up extra bandwidth, and do your participants need to use um, your, their video via webcams? Uh, if they don't, then by all means, just use slides and audio. Um, that's sort of a pared down uh, version. However, it might be, certainly for the for me, staff meetings, it seems really useful to have uh, the webcam and the video so we can actually see each other and we can continue to you know build on those rapports and the relationships, that seems pretty critical. Uh, obviously, the more people you have in the session, the more strain it's going to put and the more bandwidth it's going to use. So for smaller groups, um, obviously, it's, it's not really going to be a problem in Collaborate. Bear in mind, there is a strict limit, um, 250 for normal sessions in Collaborate. However, if you want to go above that, you have to tick a box as you're setting the session up, which will allow up to 500 participants. I'm hoping that you wouldn't ever have a session with more than that. Um, I've not seen that happen yet anyway. So um, if you're using a webcam, it's really, I think, important to just get a couple of things right so that you have a good visual experience. So. Um, I've seen a lot of examples where people have got the lighting and the positioning very wrong. And it seems like a little thing, What's the? but it, it makes a big difference, I think. You need to be able to see people. If you can't see people, then you may as well not have the webcam. So make sure that the subject, I, me, is lit so the light is shining against me, not behind me. Because if you are, uh, if the light's coming from behind, so if I was sitting with a window behind me, I may come out as sort of um, a shadow, uh, a silhouette against a window. Likewise, don't blast yourself so that the, the the subject is overexposed and the background is dark. So there's two two sort of common mistakes that are very easy to remedy just by moving around or changing the lighting. Um, also, <clears throat> the angle of the webcam is quite important. So often on a laptop, people will open up the screen and the, the, the built-in webcam, if you're using that, um, will be kind of basically pointing upwards so you look down and it's kind of basically giving you the up the nose shot, which is really not flattering. Um, Dead easy to, to fix. You can just raise the laptop slightly, put it on a couple of books if you like. Um, and also, I would on this point, I would recommend if you've got one using um, a an external USB webcam because they're often much better quality than the integrated ones. Um, and that also allows you to often put it on top of your monitor, so you'll get a much more um, flattering view from from above rather than up under the chin. 
Also, finally on this point, um, headsets. So a lot of people just um, will just resort to using um, probably their their laptops, built-in microphone uh, and speaker and webcam. And it's okay and you can get by with that, but often you can also get a bit of echo uh, and a bad audio experience because of the microphone and the speakers kind of like um, feeding into each other. So I would definitely recommend if you can get, your, if you've got some more, if you can get your hands on them, some kind of like USB headset, ideally USB, because it means you don't have to fiddle around with the setting, you just plug it in and you're good to go. And if they've got a built-in microphone like this, it's great for isolating that sound. So you'll get a much better audio experience and it will also pick up much less of the world around you. So you won't be able to hear those screaming kids in the room next door. Right, number three, log in early and don't go on too long. So these are two um, important things too, I think. So don't leave it to the last minute. Some people I've noticed are just sort of logging in. Maybe they're coming from another meeting. And I understand that it's busy at the moment. But if you come in late or just on time for a webinar and suddenly then you find you've got an issue that you need to resolve, something's not, maybe your audio is not working, you've given yourself no time for that. So if you can get in early, I'd say at least 15 minutes because often, you know, even if you do get in and everything's fine, it gives you that little bit of chance to maybe, you know, do a bit of like, um, sort of ice breaking, just catching up with people or, or just kind of like making people feel at ease. So it's, it's, there's certainly not a problem with having a few minutes extra at the beginning. Very tiring being in um, online teaching sessions and meetings, two hour ones, especially so. Um, so I would try and keep it as short as you can. Bear in mind that yourself and your participants will get um, sort of fatigued by this. Um, so maybe build in a break, for example, if you've got a normal two hour lecture, Try and build in a break in the middle or maybe even two breaks where I've seen this done and it's very successful uh, where you just say, right, go away, you know, have, have 10 minutes, just have a rest, go and put the kettle on, whatever, uh, and we'll reconvene in 10 minutes time. And I think that works really well. Number four, make sure your participants know um, where they're going and what they're going to do. So when you set up an, a, a, um, a Collaborate webinar, make sure you send them the link, preferably in plenty of time so they know. Uh, when it's going to happen and how they get in, so how they join with that link. And also it's a good idea perhaps to give them an agenda so they know exactly what you're going to cover um, and any materials that you might want to share ahead of the, the webinar, so any uh, pre-reading, for example. Um, and that's all, you know, it sounds obvious, but all good stuff to be thinking about um, prior to it actually starting. Number five is kind of related to the previous point, and that is share videos with your learners beforehand. So at the moment, Lots of people are wanting to share a video within a teaching session. That's a very common thing and a good thing to do. It happens very easily in a face to face teaching session online. We're not quite there yet. The technology doesn't quite support this in, a, in, in the way we would like it to. So rather than trying to play a video whilst you're screen sharing, which can often be very problematic, especially for any learners with a, sort of a, a slower broadband, they just won't get a good experience with that. It might not play at all. You might not get the sound. Um, and that it might just be very choppy. So if you want them to watch videos, don't stop that. That's a good thing. But I would recommend uh, sending links to the videos to the participants beforehand and just say, you know, we'd like to talk about this video in the session or these videos. Please make sure you've watched them before you attend. Number six is record your session. Um, great idea to do this because um, especially if you've got, um, particularly with um, with teaching sessions, I think, if you've got learners in different time zones, they can't always make the sessions that you arrange. Um, so it's a great idea to record them. Um, they may have, uh, might be time zone problems, or they may have just childcare problems, for example, where they just can't attend or they've got other commitments. So record it. Um, and if you're using breakout rooms and more and more people are doing this now, and that's a good thing, um, be, be aware, we've noticed that if everybody drops out of the main room in a collaborate session to go into other breakout groups, um, if there's no one in the main room, it will actually stop the recording. If people stay in the main room throughout, then the recording will continue. Now, that's not a problem because you can actually just restart the recording. You need to remember to do this, of course, but you can restart the, re the recording every, once everybody resumes back into the main room. And don't worry, it won't overwrite the previous recording. You'll just end up with two or more separate recordings every time you start it again. And you can just share those links with your uh, students afterwards. It brings me on to point seven nicely, and that is share your recorded sessions with your learners. And this might also apply to some meetings as well. Um, but um, for, for certainly for teaching purposes, um, those that couldn't attend either because of the reasons we mentioned earlier, um, or if they did attend and they just want to rewatch it sort of for revision or if they didn't understand uh, certain bits, uh, make sure you're sharing that recording with them via an email announcement and then they can all watch it. And 
Also related to the previous point, number eight is make your webinar recordings available to download. So not, it's a good idea to do this, not just let people stream it back, but actually let them uh, download it so they've got an offline copy they can watch as well. This is really useful if they're not obviously connected to the internet, if they're traveling, although at the moment there's not a lot of traveling happening, I admit. Um, but generally, as a principle, it's a good idea to allow them to download that. And you need to do that by ticking a box when you actually set up um, the webinar in the first place. OK, so we move on to number nine. There's only two left. We're doing OK. So number nine is use ground rules. So don't be afraid to, to set some ground rules at the beginning. In fact, you know, your students will probably thank you for it because it will make the whole learning experience more smooth. There'll be uh, certain rules that everyone will adhere to. Uh, and things you might want to suggest are um, encourage all students, well, participants, um, this because this applies to meetings as well again, to mute their microphone if they're not speaking. So everyone at the beginning should mute their microphone. Everyone, ideally, except the person who's currently speaking, should have their microphone muted. Um, also, encourage uh, your participants to use the chat window in the bottom on the bottom right corner or on the right part. Um, also, include your students to use the chat window on the right. Um, this is a really good way of communicating during a session, um, but it also allows people to ask questions, make comments without actually interrupting the flow of the session. So that's a good way of managing contributions. Um, if you do want people to use verbal contributions, and that is a good thing as well, um, do it. But um, I would suggest laying down the law at the beginning and saying, yeah, by all means, if you've got a microphone, you want to speak. Great. But put your hand up first and then basically as a as a sort of a chair, you'll be able to manage that. So there's a little icon at the bottom. They can put the hand up and then you can when it's good for you, you can stop and say, Barbara, you had a question. Would you like to speak now? And that makes it much more um, easy to manage. So when you're setting the ground rules, it's probably a good idea to reinforce that point about the session being recorded. So just um, make sure that people know, uh, explain the benefits so that it can be rewatched by those that aren't there, but also those that have been there. But also it's probably a good opportunity just to remind people to be careful and mindful about the contributions that they do make. Number 10, if in doubt, ask the learning technologists. So don't forget we're around, myself, Dan and James. We're very much involved in supporting uh, Collaborate sessions currently, and there's a, um, a lot of them happening. Um, but between us, we're managing to um, make sure that everyone's, you know, um, getting on with it OK and not having any problems. It is a good tool, I think, generally speaking. It's pretty easy to use and it's um, it's not common that we have technical problems, certainly not ones that we can get get over. Um, so, yeah, if you need any help, if you need any training in it, if you want to have a go with it or if you want someone to be there when you're running your session, um, then all, by all means, get in touch with one of us or use the Chartel account. So thanks for listening to those 10 points. Um, I did think it was useful to share those because it's the things that we've noticed um, and things that we think if you can just take, bear those in mind, I think that it'll make it easier for everybody um, and we'll hopefully have continue to have uh, a good learning experience and be able to have good, useful meetings for staff online. Um.